chapter 48. We give you our thanks for bringing us another time into the house of the Lord. We bow before the Lord and pray. Eternal Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for the spirit of our lives. We are forever grateful to you, Lord, for your goodness, your love, and your mercies, your faithfulness towards us. Cleanse our hearts from sin. Bless us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding even as we open up the Holy Word of God. Have thy own we pray in the name of your Son, Yeshua. Amen. All right, we are picking up in the book of Genesis, where we left off last week. And uh, we are going to pick up, uh, let me see, verse. Okay, let's just pick up from verse 3. Today, we, we covered that already, but we'll just pick up there and just move on. But before, before I, I go into the text, I'd just like to say to you guys, we, we ought not to allow nobody, you know, to um, protect us from the Bible. You know, as, as students of the Bible, we, we're not supposed to allow nobody, nobody, whether it's a pastor or a bishop or a doctor or whoever the person is, nobody that's supposed to protect us from the Bible. And when I say protecting us from the Bible, I'm talking about there are some people who think that there are some forbidden knowledge in the Bible that we're not supposed to know about and that we're not supposed to talk about. So therefore, they will do their best not to talk about it. There, there, there will be things in the Bible that some people think that if you talk about it, it's like God is going to send you to hell if you talk about it. So therefore, you, you, you're supposed to just ignore it and just let it go. But if it's in the Bible, it is God wants us to talk about it. Even though that there, there are things that might be uh, sounding a little bit uncomfortable. And when you talk about it, some people might not be comfortable talking about it, but still, it's in the Bible. And we ought not to, you know, be afraid to discuss things when we see it in the Bible. It's not anything for us to get angry or upset about, but if it's in the Bible, it is something that the Lord wants us to talk about. That's the reason why it's in the text. So we pick up in verse 3. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and will multiply your descendant. I will make you a multitude of nations. And I will give this land of Canaan to your descendant after you as an everlasting possession. So that's where we left off last week. And, uh, you know, I was asking the question, you know, when we look at the promises, all of the promises that was given to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the Most High God, where God said to them, uh, especially to Abraham, said to him that he's going to make him a father of many nations. And he said that he's going to um, bless him. He's going to increase his descendant upon the earth. And they will be numberless like the stars of the heaven. And they will be numberless like the dust of the earth, the sand of the seashore. Those are promises that is given to um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in regards to their descendant. And God said many nations were supposed to come out of Abraham. And that's the reason why he's called the father of many nations. So therefore, I, we asked the question last week, if when we look at modern day Israel and we see the amount of people that they have as Jewish people or Hebrew people, we asked the question last week whether or not if the promise of God failed, did the promise of God fail because for 4,000 years, because from the time of uh, Abraham up to the time that we are living, it's approximately 4,000 years. And during that uh, span to our time, we see right now today as we speak, the population of uh, Jewish people is just around 15 million people. And when we look at what the Lord said to Abraham, that he's going to increase them, he's going to multiply them, they're going to become numberless. There are many nations is going to come out of them. And we see that is not being fulfilled today. And it, it, it must, it's troublesome. 
Because when you look at, for instance, the other son of Abraham, Ishmael, anybody know who Ishmael is? Yeah. Ishmael, he was the fourth biological son of Abraham. He was with Hagar, the Egyptian woman. And Ishmael also had 12 sons. And God gave prophecies also to Ishmael and told him that, you know, he's going to make many nations. He's going to come out of his lineage. And when we look at uh, the, the, the nations that come out of the lineage of Ishmael, we see, first of all, the Arab uh, nation that came out of uh, Ishmael. Well, that's what they claim. They came up, they associated with Ishmael. And when you look at the uh, map today, you will see that there is 22 countries, 22 countries that align themselves with Arab nation. And from those 22 uh, countries, there is, uh, I think it's 450 million people that ascribe to being uh, Arab. Now, when you talk about Muslim, Muslim also link up with Arabs, right? Because all of them uh, ascribe to Abraham and Ishmael and stuff like that. And when you add the Muslim with the Arab uh, uh, nations and people, you're talking about another one 0.5 billion people. So the Muslim and the Arab linked together today as we speak is, is 2 point something billion people in, in number. And then we talk about Christianity. Christianity is 2.5 billion. And then we talk about the chosen people of God is only 15 million. So therefore there, there is something that is wrong there. And it, I know it's something that is hard to talk about and most people don't like to talk about these things. But it is in the scripture. The scripture said that he's going to make nations out of Israel. God never intend for just one nation of people coming out of uh, the race that is called, or the nation that is called Israel. It was supposed to be many nations coming out of Israel. People were supposed to live in different countries. Nation of people living in a different country. But what is happening is that as I was saying last week, the Ashkenazi uh, white Jewish people from Europe, what they did, they make Judaism a special club. It's a special club, so it's only special people can get in, into that uh, club. You have to be uh, European, you have to be Ashkenazi or Sephardic to get in. Even look at the um, uh, Ethiopian Jews. Remember the Ethiopian Jews that were airlift uh, years ago, I think it was in the 80s? In the 80s, they airlift uh, a couple thousand of them to Israel. They are really counted as uh, Jews, even though they are in Israel. And who know the amount of uh, you know Jewish black people that is in uh, Ethiopia that remain there. But what I'm saying, it doesn't match up. It means that if uh, the nation that we are calling Israel today, if that little bit of people, that 15 million people worldwide, is what God was talking about. It means that the promise of God failed and it did not come to pass. Right now, there is a, 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 a tribe of people in Africa, the um, Igbo tribe. They have more than 40 million people in that tribe and they claim to be um, Hebrew or uh, Jewish and that claim goes back for thousands of years. All of their ancestors keep on doing the same kind of a ritual. All of the things that is being talked about in the Bible, Passover and all of the different festivals and all of the different things that the people used to keep in the Bible. These people are doing it and they are not recognized because the uh, white uh, Jewish group of people in Israel, they are the one that have the, the say to recognize if a person is recognized as a Jew. If they don't give you the okay, it doesn't matter how much uh, ceremony or how much you tell yourself you might be uh, Jewish, they don't recognize you. So what we are saying is that this does not match up with what the Bible is saying. And when something doesn't match up with what the Bible is saying, we ought to call it out. And you know, this is the reason why we have so much um, racism in Christian belief today, is because there are so many things in the Bible that have racism attached to it. And because of the fact that we are, we are afraid to 
um, you know, stand up and call them out. You know, these things have been going on for such a long time. For instance, we're going to talk about why Jesus. Why Jesus is the foundation of racism, white supremacy. The foundation of racism, white supremacy, is connected to white Jesus. And I know it's something that most people will not want to talk about, but it is true. When you read your history, you will see that is where racism started. Another thing, again, that is connected to racism is white um, chosen people, the white chosen people, selective chosen people. That is another part of racism, another part of Christian belief that is racism. Another part of Christian belief, again, that is racism, is where they teach us that, um, you know, uh, all people except uh, Jewish people, Ashkenazi Jewish people, they are all um, Gentiles. That is not a, a biblical doctrine. That is a doctrine that is rooted in racism. And it comes from the Christian church. And until we as Bible-believing people you know, start studying the Bible for ourselves and see that these things don't match with what the Bible is saying. Racism is going to prevail. You know, we talk today, we try to raise up and rise up against racism, but until we start to rise up against it in the church, because racism didn't start by worldly people. Racism, white supremacy doctrine wasn't spread by worldly people, it came out from the church. It is good white Christian men who take up the Bible and they start reading in Genesis when we talk about the curse of Noah, when Noah uh, came up from the ark and he planted a vineyard and he put, uh, you know, he drank wine, he became drunk and then, um, you know, he, his nakedness was exposed and they said that according to the scripture, his son Ham saw his nakedness and I guess he made fun of him or whatever he did. Noah awoke and they revealed to him what happened. He put a curse on his grandson Canaan. And what these white interpreters, theologians say way back is that the curse that was placed on Noah's grandson caused Noah, um, Ham and his grandson Canaan to become black. And God condemned um, Ham and Canaan and all of their race to servitude, meaning that they have to become slave to the rest of the people of the world. So when the time came for them to go down into Africa to enslave people, they used the Bible. You, listen, I'm not telling you something that I make up. This thing is in history recorded long before I was born. I'm only 62 years. This thing is older than 62 years. So you don't think that Pastor Long can make up this in his basement. This is what the, the people who put these doctrines out, they put it down in writing. And what they say is that the curse that was placed on Ham, it caused the skin of Noah and Canaan to become black. Look for instance, look at the Mormon church. The, the, the Mormon church just recently tried to remove from its doctrine the curse of Ham that was placed on black people. And the Mormon church, they wasn't allowing black people to, be, to, to reach to a certain level in the Mormon church because of the fact that they said that there is this curse on black people. So that's what I'm saying. These things is rooted in racism. It's a, it's a foundation of racism. And until the church and the, the teachers and preachers in the church start to denounce these doctrines and say that these doctrines are not biblical, we have to pull it down from inside the church. Because it came out from the church. It is rooted in the church. Amen. 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 Pastor, yes. One thing here, I will be studying the Bible for a long time. Yes, sir. I want to go one of these, but most of the are really done to write. Because the answer is right. The answer is right there. Yeah. The word human. The Bible says that that's just a big man. And I don't know that word to call it human. So that, that, is, that is the word that we interpret properly. Because when you look at the word you, it's another word they put to man. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you look at the word Hadam, as I said, Hadam, in, in, in Hebrew. Yes. What do you think it means? It means black dot. Mm -hmm. Well, it's black dot. But you're right. That's what it mean. it's, it means. So everybody, when you really look at it, I want to go back and I study. We did that in school. They, they call it um, humus, which is a um, decay organism. So when you have a cohort, when, when all the grass break, break down, it becomes dark. 
And it's very powerful. So that's the same thing you're talking about. But you, you see, so that every human being comes from them. The, the thing is that we are not going to be delivered. This oppression that I see we are facing today, we are not going to be delivered from it and still we start to attack it from where it starts from. Right. It starts from out of the Bible. Men take it from out of the Bible. They miss it out of the Bible and they start to use these things to oppress people. And when we preach it and we teach it and we see them, we have to call them out. And until we as a people start calling out these things, the oppression is not going to stop. You know, for instance, you know, it's only recently they start to acknowledge us as black people as Christian. We proud to need to be called Christian. I don't, I'm not proud of that name Christian. You know? I don't really want to go about calling myself a Christian. I rather call myself salt of the earth, light of the world, uh, God fearing people, or something like that. But Christian, I don't really, I, I, I don't really, really want to have so much dealings to do with that name because it's only recently, it's only you know some years they start allow us to get that name because during the time of slavery. It was only white people who were called Christian. If you're white, you are Christian. You didn't have to be born again. Once you was a, a, a European, an English, or a French person, they give you that name Christian. And it didn't have anything to do with you accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. So when our people see that, you know, to become a Christian means that you're supposed to be free, they start accepting the religion that was offered to them and you know, start calling themselves Christian. But still, the white people never acknowledge them as Christian because being Christian means that you're free. And back in that time, to be free, it means that you have to be white. So that, therefore, that, that's what I'm saying. These things, we have to stand against them. And we have to, we can't ignore these things when we see them in the Bible. And what we're talking about here, this is a part of racism. When we look at what the Bible is telling us, that God said that a multitude of nations, not one nation, no, multitude of nations is going to come out of the blessing that God said is going to pour out on Abraham. And now what we are seeing is one selected group, one selected group, European people, Ashkenazi and Sephardi. Um, the uh, Ashkenazi is from Germany and those other European countries, and the Sephardi is from Spain and the, uh, the Iberian Peninsula and stuff like that. And yes, I'm going to come to you. And the, in, the other people, there's lots of other groups of people, you know, throughout the world who acknowledge that they are um, uh, Jews. There are people up in India, some people up in China, groups of people, lots of people, millions of people going in Africa. But they can't, even though they, they, they are absorbing all of these laws for, you know, hundreds of years. They are not acknowledged as being Jews until the um, white people in Israel acknowledge them. And they are not going to do it. So that's the reason why you see the um, population of Jewish people is so small. For 4,000 years, it's only 15 million people. It means that it's an exclusive club and they only let in who they want to let in. Yes, brother, go ahead. Yes, well, the question I want to ask. Um, the word, the, the, the terminology white, it is a name of a race of people or a name of a cult? No, uh, well, uh, white people was re really recently, uh, it's, it's something, back in the Bible time, they never used to call nobody white, right? they never used to call nobody black. As I said before, um, they used to identify you by what nation or what country you're from. For instance, if you was, uh, uh, let's suppose you was uh, a German, they call you a German person or a British person. They call you a Spanish person. They call you a French person. It's during uh, the time when they were trying to bring in this miscegenation laws. They tried to outlaw that. They didn't want black men to take white women. As I said before, back in that time, uh, women was limited. White women was limited in the colonies that they have in the United States before the United States became um, you know, uh, uh, a country. Uh, white women was limited, and white men that was available, a lot of them used to choose to go with three black men, and sometimes even with the slaves and the Indians. So you find that the white boys then wasn't getting their, their women. So what they did, they keep, they keep bringing over uh, white girls from, from England, and when they come over, these white girls, sometimes they might go with a white guy, yes, but most of the time they want to hook up with the black guys and the Indians and the free slaves. So what they did, they bring in this miscegenation law 
they make it against the law for a white woman to to hook up with a black man. And sometimes they will imprison them, or sometimes they will put them into servitude. So therefore, that's where they start calling uh, people white. But before they used to call them French, they call them Spanish, they call them British, and they call them Portuguese. They used to call them by the country that they're from. They never used to call nobody white back in that time. So I don't know if that helped you or not, brother. Pastor, what, what I'm saying, I try not my best not to use this. this. That's for me, that's my philosophy. Because when I did my own studies, I realized there is no such thing as white people. The only one part of the Bible that, re that mentioned white is when Moses went up to the morning bush. And Lord Moses was testing yes. God, and yes. God told him to put his hand on the bosom. Mm. And when he took it out, he became white like leprosy. So it was a disease. So what was when, he before? So he complained something to be dark. So, <laughs> so, so when, he, when he put it back, then he come back to the original color. Right. That's the only thing I can remember in the Bible that was white. But it was it's invented. It, it, it was invented. I, I know these things are, are not comfortable to, uh, to talk about, but that's what I'm saying. That is the reason why we have these things going on for so long. Because everybody think, well, oh, we shouldn't be talking about this in church. We never hear it before in church. Why are we talking about it? But it's in the Bible and it's misinterpreted. People, they use the Bible to oppress people. Listen, I'm telling you, the things I know now about the Bible, if I have the knowledge of what I have now about the Bible, what some of the things that I see that was communicated to us that was is not true. Some of the things that I used to preach over the years, I regret I used to preach some of these things. When you look back and see some of the things that I used to preach, and you only preach it because somebody feed it to you. A lot of things that a lot of things that they teach us in Bible college, Bible seminary. I used to go to Bible seminary, pay thousands of dollars, go to Bible sem seminary, buy thousands of dollars in books, you know, theological books. And a lot of these things is what these white European guys interpret. And they tell us what the Bible is saying, and, but none of us, none of us really take the time to really check it out. Because when you go to Bible college, you can't like how we sit down here and we are um, discussing, and somebody have a, a different point of view to what I have, and I will listen to them. When you go to Bible college, there's no such thing. You know, I, I remember going to Bible college, and the, the uh, professor he will take one hour session, and he will go through. The four, um, four books of the Bible. Could you imagine you going through uh, the Bible, the four, four books of the Bible, in one one hour session in teaching? What can you learn? What can you um, understand? And you just put everything out, and whatever he put out, you have to just take it because you have to do it according to what he said because you're not going to get a grade. I remember one time when I was going, you know, they were, we were doing a, a subject. It was a uh, uh, something that we were doing on hearing the voice of God and you know you have to uh, talk about ways that you think uh, God is speaking to you and according to what the professor put uh, what the professor put out he said that the way that you hear the voice of God is when you, you literally hear God speaking to you and you hear it when you, you get a prophecy and all of these kind of things you know I said yes you know there was a time when you know God speak to people in my in my writing when I'm doing my um, test, I put them well in, you know, there were times that God used to speak in prophecy, speak to us literally and stuff like that. But today in our time, when we hear the voice of God, the primary way in which we hear the voice of God is by the word of God. Is when we read the scripture, that is the primary way that God is speaking to us today. So I emphasize my essay on that. You know what he did? He didn't, he didn't give me um, a full grade. He dropped my grade. I, I, usually I'll get maybe 90, 95%. What he did, he dropped it down to a lower grade because I didn't start talking about hearing God's voice through prophecy and all of these kind of things that they expect you to hear, you know, uh, or to say when they teach it. So therefore, when you go to these places, they just fool your head up with, with things and you don't have the time to really check it out. So now I'm studying the Bible for myself and I'm checking things out. I'm seeing that some of these things don't match up. Amen. All right. We, we move on. <laughs> All right. So in verse 5. Now I am, now this is Jacob now. So he already, he talked about um, the way that God said he's going to bless him and his descendants. He's going to increase them. And 
he said, there's a part of the verse that I should touch on too. He said at the end of that verse, verse 4, and I will give thee this land of Canaan to your descendant after you as an everlasting possession. Anybody who reads history and anybody who listens to the news, you will hear from time to time, any time uh, the Prime Minister of Israel making any kind of reference to the Bible, it always has to be in reference to what God said concerning the possession of the land of Israel. Anytime they talk about anything in regards to the Bible is when they're talking about God said that he's going to give Israel the land forever. But different to that, people from Israel, they don't really have time uh, for the Bible. People from Israel, is Israelite people or Jewish people, you know, they only recognize the God of the Bible when it comes to the land. Except for coming to the land, they don't have anything to do with the God of the Bible. The main book, the main uh, religious book of the um, Jewish people is not the Bible. The main Jewish book of the Jewish people is the Talmud. The Talmud, they read the Talmud. They get all of their instruction from the Talmud. They don't, the, the, the Bible is not their source, main source of, uh, of, of uh, religious information. The, their main source of religious information is from the Talmud. So the only time they refer to the Bible is when they're talking about the possession of the land. They will say, well, God said, just like what we said in the text here, God said that he's going to give the, 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 the children of Israel, children of Jacob, this land, and he's going to give it to them forever. That is what they um, will emphasize on. Look at the size of the um, Jewish people, as we said, it's about 15 million in Israel. Israel is a small uh, country. You know, uh, per capita, Israel has more atheists than any other place in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Most uh, Jewish people are atheists. They don't recognize no God. You know, they, they, they'll tell you about the Jewish state is their God. And still, we say that, you know, that those people, they are the chosen people of God. I say no, I don't believe it. Amen. So we move on. Okay. So it tells us in verse 5. Now I am claiming as my own sons these two boys of yours. That, that, that is Jacob talking to Joseph. He's saying the two sons that Joseph had uh, before Jacob went down into Egypt. He's claiming them. Ephraim and Manasseh who were born here in the land of Egypt before I arrived, they will be my sons, just as Reuben and Simeon are. So what is happening here is that Jacob is adopting the two sons of uh, Joseph. He is adopting them. He's making them his sons. And these guys is going to have uh, inheritance in the land of Israel. And what he's doing here, he um, he disinherit his four two sons. Notice Reuben and Simeon. <laughs> Reuben and Simeon. <laughs> uh, it, let me see what he talk about. What he said here. Um, yes, si um, Reuben and Simeon. Reuben, Reuben is the first born son. But what Jacob is doing here, Jacob is taking away the, the birthright. The birthright is taken away from, from Reuben, and he took away the birthright from Reuben. Anybody know why the birthright was taken away from Reuben? You have any idea why the birthright was taken away from Reuben? Any idea? Why did God take, where, why did um, Jacob? Why did he um, took the birthright from Reuben? Because back in the day, you know that the firstborn is entitled to a double portion. And why did he take the board right? Anybody know that? I think, um, he's, he's, I think he wanted to he he sleep with Jacob's son, um, his wife or something? Yes, yes, that's it. He, he, he slept with um, Jacob's uh, concubine. It was the wife of his son. He slept with Jacob's concubine. It was the maid that was given by Rachel to Jacob. Um, Reuben slept with that woman and some interpreters believe that he did it because of the fact that after the death of Rachel <laughs> he, or, or even before the death I don't know if it happened before the death of Rachel I think so 
He wanted us to promote his mother. His mother was Leah. And you know, Leah was not the number one wife. Right. So what he was doing here, he, he defiled. He defiled uh, Rachel, maid that was given to uh, Jacob. He defiled her. And some people believe that um, she probably was intoxicated. Probably she was drunk when he did it. So he defied her so that his father will make um, his mother, Leah, the number one wife. That is what some theologians are saying, and it could be true. So because he defiled his father's uh, wife, uh, Jacob, what he did, he um, disinherited him. And Jacob, he could have taken the other son in line. Anybody know who was the other son in line? Who, who was in line? Simeon was the next son in line, but Jacob didn't take him. And the other son in line after Simeon was Levi. Anybody know, anybody remember why these two other guys were disqualified? Yes, these guys, these are the two brothers. Remember when uh, Dinah was raped? When the Shishamite guy, Prince of Shishem, he raped Dinah and uh, Simeon and uh, uh, Levi. Because they were Dinah, uh, brother by mother and father. So they took it upon themselves and they went into this place and they killed all of the men. Remember, they, they, they make a deal with them. If they circumcise, they're going to take them into the tribe. And then when they take the circumcision, and they, these guys were in pain. Because you guys know what circumcision is all about. They couldn't move about, and these guys move in with the sword and they slaughter the whole village. So because they did that, Jacob hold that against them. And if you want to get more about that, we could just turn over to um, uh, Second First uh, Chronicles. Let's let's read about it a little bit. Go ahead. Yeah, because the, the type of alcohol they have now, and the alcohol they have now, is this different? Nah. Well, who knows? Maybe it, it probably might have been stronger then. It all depends on how they used to um, ferment it, but alcohol, alcohol was alcohol and it was strong back in the day too. Because I, I spoke to people that are drunk, that are drunk already and it seems to be they have the right sense. But, that, but why when every time they do something wrong, they always blame alcohol? Yeah, but that, some, some people, some people could, some people could be intoxicated, right? And they have control. You have some people who will, who will drink a lot. Yeah. I know, I know um, police officers are going to disagree with me, but you have people who will drink a whole lot and they will still be able to try it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I know one guy yeah. used to work with us from stocks. Yes. And, and he used to jump on his bike when he done and drive straight over the other. Yes, some people, some people will be intoxicated and they're able to drive, but that don't mean they're supposed to be on the road. Right. You know, and you have some people again who just take one shot. <laughs> As we say, one shot of liquor and they're out. You know, so, um, Let's read, um, uh, it's uh, First Chronicles chapter 5, sorry guys, First Chronicles chapter 5, anybody find it? Okay, read it, read it if you get it, read it. Alright, First Chronicles, okay, I'll read it then, let me read it. No, you gotta read it hard. Okay, I'll get it. I'll read it. Okay, so it said, uh, the oldest son of Israel was Reuben, but since he dishonored his father by sleeping with one of his father's concubine, his birthright was given to the son of his brother Joseph. For this reason, Reuben is not listed in the genealogical record as the firstborn son, the descendant of Judah, because the most became the most powerful tribe and provide a ruler for the nation. But the boy tribe belonged to Joseph. So because of what um, Reuben did, sleeping with his father's wife, the double portion was taken away from him. And Jacob didn't go one step down. He didn't go to the next son in line to give them the boy tribe because uh, Simeon and Levi did you know what they did by killing all of these uh, people. So what he did, he um, passed the boat right on to um, Joseph. And what he's doing here, adopting the two sons of Joseph by adopting 
um, Manasseh and Ephraim. What he's doing here, he is giving Joseph a double portion. He's giving him a double portion. You know, I understand what he's doing here, but I still, I still uh, disagree. I don't like the idea of disinheriting children. I know what the, his son Reuben did was something that was bad, but we can't, that's what I'm saying, there are things in the Bible that we can't say, well, because somebody do this, we can do this, and we can make a, a, a copy off of that. Some things in the Bible is not for us to copy. And I would not disinherit any of my children. I don't, I don't have no extra wife, so I, you know, none of my sons would be able to sleep with you know, my, 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 my extra wife. But it, it doesn't matter what your children might do, whatever mistake they might make. You know, a lot of times our children, they don't really turn out the way that we want them to turn out to. Sometimes we want you know, them to be just like us. Sometimes we want them to you know, be able to financially responsible. And sometimes they're not financially responsible. And because they're not financially responsible, they squander their money and stuff like that. And we decide that we are going to just disinherit them. And, you know, it's that, I mean, say we can do it if we choose to because it belongs to us. But the thing is, it does not bring family together. When you gone, after you already disinherit your child or, who, you know, maybe two of them, whatever, those two that you disinherit, they're going to hate the rest of the brothers and sisters. So therefore, you might as well, you just, you know, you may not be able to give all of them equal possession because one might be more attendant, uh, uh, attendant to you during the time when you are, you know, on your bed or whatever, you're sick, and you decide to give that person a double portion. But to totally disinherit one, I disagree with that. But Joseph did not totally disinherit um, his four son. What he did, he took away the privilege of the, um, the board right. He didn't have the double portion. But he still had um, a portion uh, with uh, the people. Okay, so where we are now? Another question, Pastor. Yes. Yes, Con consider what, what um, Jacob did. If that was part of the principle in the family, what do you mean? The laws in the family. To give a double portion. The culture and the family laws because the principles, principles, principles can change his laws. So if, if, it, if it is laws and his principles, Joseph and um, Jacob had the right to do it. No, well, I think it was a custom. It wasn't no law. Well, I, don't think, I don't think it was a law. If it's, if it's principles, principles are, are based on consistent culture. I don't think it was a law. I don't think, I don't think uh, whoever the ruling authority was back in the day, could have charged him for doing that. That was something that he had uh, the right, the prerogative to do. Uh, but that was what most, it seems like most family back in the day, that is what they used to do. The, 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 the firstborn uh, son, uh, not daughter, firstborn son, he's supposed to get a double portion. Look what happened with um, Jacob also. Yeah. It happened with Jacob. Jacob and, 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 uh, and Esau, they were twins. And Jacob, he uh, tried to come out first, but Isa came out first. You remember that? Yeah. And Jacob was the, 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 the second born, and Isa was the firstborn son. But uh, Jacob took away the birthright. He stayed, he, stayed, he, he stole the blessing also from from Isa. And not only that, we we, we 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 saw that happen also with Abraham. Abraham's firstborn son is not Isaac. Uh, Ishmael is the firstborn son, but he didn't get the blessing. We saw with uh, Judah, Judah also, remember when Judah went and he took um, this Canaanite woman, and Judah, firstborn, uh, didn't get the um, blessing. It was uh, Perez uh, who got the blessing. So um, a lot of times the way how we expect things to turn out may not turn out in that fashion. But as you know, I was saying, I don't think it was any law that really dictate the way that these things happen. It all depends, you know, the parents. Parents decide to give the uh, the firstborn blessing to the firstborn, and they do that. But here we see in this case, because of the fact that um, Jacob firstborn displeased him, so therefore he had the prerogative, and he, he took it away. He gave it to somebody else. He gave it to the the, the person that he. Um, 
you know, want to give it to, uh, which was Joseph. Joseph was his beloved son. Okay, so let me try to move ahead a little bit. Um, so he said, no, I'm claiming as my own son, in verse 5, these two boys of yours. No, what I'm noticing here is that Jacob did not, you see whether he didn't pray to God, I didn't see where he prayed to God and asked God permission. Did he ask God permission to choose these two boys as his son? Well, the text never tell us. And as I say this, like, I don't see where he prayed and asked the Lord permission to um, adopt these two boys. And I ask myself the question, do we have to ask God permission for everything we do so that we can get the blessing of God? You as a God-fearing people, you as a God-fearing person, as a salt of the earth, a light of, light of the world, do you have to ask the permission of God for everything that you do so that you can get his blessing, you can get his approval? Think about what I'm saying. Do we have to ask God permission for everything, everything that we do? I want the approval of God. I want the favors of God. I want the blessing of God. Everything I do, I have to ask God's permission. Is that, is that how uh, we operate? I find it's a good question, Pastor. Let me yes. Yeah, well, you know I said it? Because sometimes we are ignorant on some information. So if you have the uh, collective information, right. you know, we won't know what to do. But right. if you know what to do specifically, have the information, right, then we could apply it. Right. But right. if you have the, the, the information, then we could go to the Father. Okay. So yes, I agree with that. So if, if we have knowledge, if we know what is the will of God about something, we don't need to go and pray about it again. Because we already know well, this, the text already saying it's in the will of God. I can just go ahead and do it and I know God is going to be pleased, God is going to bless it. But as the brother said, you know, there are things that are not written in the word of God that you're not sure about. And you will have to go and, you know, you ask the Lord and seek the Lord uh, on that uh, subject. But most of the times, is the thing that we want to do, God is going to allow you. As a Christian, huh? well, I don't like to use that word so much. As a God-fearing person, as a light of the world, salt of the earth. Believer. Yes, as a, a, a believer ambassador. in Yeshua. Ambassador. 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 It, is, it is the things that we want to do. The thing, because I mean, say you are not a, a sinful person. Eh? If you are, are, are born again and you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're changed on the inside. You're not a worldly person. You're not uh, greedy or over things. And you have a desire within your heart. It is the desire that you have in your heart. Once you know that you're not running ahead of God, you're not trying to get things before you know, your time, those are the things that God is going to approve of. You know, uh, you have something in your heart and you're seeking God about it. You know, those things, you pray about it. You know, God is going to um, approve it most of the time. The only time it won't be approved if if it's not the right time or if it's something that God thinks that you're not supposed to, to to have or to do, then you won't get it and you won't be able to do it. But if it's something that you know it's in the will of God, God is going to approve it. Yes. Amen. That's the reason why we, the Bible said if we ask anything that is according to His will, He is going to grant it unto us. Yes. Amen. So. Okay, um, so uh, Jacob adopt Ephraim and Manasseh, and here we see in this case it wasn't the young, it wasn't the older son that get the blessing. Um, Manasseh, he is the fourth son, but he didn't get the blessing. So we see here again. It is, yeah, it is the younger son that got the blessing. <laughs> so therefore, it is in the power or the control of the parent to really give the blessing uh, to the one that they choose. But you see, most of the time, the Lord chose the younger one. Look at with David. David, he was the younger one, and he was the one that was chosen by the Lord to, to lead the people and to fight against Goliath and all of that. All right, so long ago, in verse 7, he continued, As I was returning from Padanaram, Rachel died 
in the land of Canaan, uh, we were still on the way some distance from Ephrata, that is uh, Bethlehem. So with great sorrow, bury her there beside the road to Ephrata. So here we see Jacob is on his dying bed, and what he's doing here, he's re recollecting some things, and he's remembering the death of Rachel. Rachel was very special to uh, Jacob, and he's remembering her death. Rachel died in childhood. She was bringing forth the last son, Benjamin, and she died while this boy was being, uh, you know, born. And here we see Jacob is talking about, he said that, he was not too far away from where he was going. But what he did, he buried her alongside the road, you know, as he was traveling. And interpreters, interpreters are asking the question, why was he saying that now? Why did he bring that up now? Most of the time, when a person is on their dying bed, the thing that they say before they die is the thing that troubled them, the thing that is really important to them. So it seems as though this was really weighing down on the mind of Jacob. And there's a possibility that Joseph was not pleased with Jacob, his father, burying his mother alongside the road while he was traveling back from Padanaram. And some interpreters believe that Joseph was not pleased because of the fact that his beloved mother the beloved wife of his father, she was not buried in the, the cave of Machpelah. So it might have been something that Joseph and Jacob probably have conversation about. And last week I was saying that Jacob was asking Joseph, if I found favor in your sight, and I didn't even study this part yet. And I was you know, kind of wondering why was he asking his son, if I find favor in your sight. So maybe, probably he thought that he was not in favor with him, and there's a possibility because, just think about it. If uh, your father have, he have, um, well, his two um, uh, wives, we're talking about Rachel and Leah. Leah was buried in the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham and Sarah and uh, Isaac and all of these guys was buried. And your mother, who's supposed to be the favorite wife of your father, she was buried along the way. Won't that trouble you? Yeah. So there's a possibility. Uh, are you guys sleeping? Yeah. <laughs> there's a possibility that it troubled um, uh, Joseph, and therefore Joseph had conversation with his father over that. So that's the reason why maybe um, Jacob brought this up. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, concerning the, uh, you just mentioned the, the, uh, the death of his mother. Mm -hmm. But okay, let's say that the, the, the specific place for burial was about if he was about five days away. Well, uh, uh, six days away, so to be, the body would be decayed. Well, okay. That right, so uh, at that point, uh, it, 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 to reach the, the place of a destination, or maybe they couldn't reach it because they have the kind of signs, you know, I don't know if they have the signs to really embalm what's the body, but right. they Yes. them. So before that happened, I don't, um, well, that was said. That was said, but what, what the text is telling us, he wasn't too far. He wasn't too far, he wasn't too far away from where he, he wanted us to go. So uh, there's a possibility that he could have taken her there if he really wanted to. Yeah. But there's all kind of different suggestions why he didn't take her there. Some people say, the first one I think they said is because of the fact that she, they say they're blaming her for bringing idol worship into the nation, because remember she stole those images from her father Laban, they're blaming her, and another one again, they say that Jacob chose to bury her along the way, because when the Israelite was uh, taken into captivity, when they were exiled on their road, when they were on the road to Babylon, because of the fact that Rachel was buried along the roadside, she came out and she prayed for them. Remember the scripture said that Rachel weeping for her children and stuff like that. So they said that Jacob, he foresaw that way in advance that his people were going to go into captivity. So what did he do? He buried Rachel out in, uh, alongside the road. So when that time comes, comes she's going to be there to weep for them. <laughs> so there, 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 there are lots of other things. And what uh, the, the elder was saying, 
about uh, the fact that he probably was a, a good distance away and there's a possibility they didn't have the uh, technology to embalm the body, the body. So therefore, he couldn't preserve the body and he didn't take her away. But I, I don't think that is what. I think he could have take her to that place if he wanted to. And another one that I was seeing, that they're saying that he didn't want to disrespect his ancestors burying two sisters. <laughs> he had, you know, two sisters as wives and he buried them in the same place. So therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Sarah might have been upset. So therefore, he couldn't bury um, two of them there. So, because of the fact that um, Leah was his legal wife, you know that she, Leah was the first one he really married her. So, um, Rachel came in after. So, therefore, he had us bury Leah there. But we don't know exactly what the reason is. But the thing is, there's, it, it, there's, a, there's a strong possibility that Joseph was not pleased. He was not pleased because of the fact that his mother was buried alongside the road. And uh, Leah was buried in uh, that favorite graveyard in that pillar. So therefore, him and his father probably have some discussion over it. And as I said before, this could be the reason why Joseph, Jacob is bringing this up. He's getting it off his chest. It bothered him. Yeah, Amen. <laughs> All right, we'll stop there. Anybody have any comment or question that you'd like to ask before we close? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment first. I'd like to make a comment here. Yes, sir. I was doing some studies on the statues that one of Jacob's wife took from the gun. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Rachel. Yeah, so Rachel. So I, I did some studies behind it because I, went, I was interested. Now, what they used to do in, all, in ancient time, they used to kill, they kill this person. Uh -huh. Take the head of the person, right. bring it back in your prison of it. And something that demon is possessing. So anytime they want to inquire, they go to it and they inquire. Mm -hmm. So she took it off, so the father would have nobody to inquire. That's, what it's, that's, that's the, the information I get there. So they took it. So when you go for it to inquire, to, to, to ask them which, which direction they go, you didn't get the information. So this, that's the reason why they had this thing like that. Well, well, you know, idol worship was a part of their culture back in that time. And, you know, it's just like the Egyptian, as we said about the Egyptian. The Egyptians have different things that they used to worship. But they used to use some of these things as a representation. Like the bull, and the falcon. I don't think, as I said before, I don't think that the Egyptians were actually worshipping these, these uh, bulls and falcons. They were using it as a symbol. You know, they are, for instance, you, you take in a bull, when you talk about a bull, you're talking about the strength of a bull, a lion or a bear. You're talking about the strength of these animals. And what they're trying to say is that the God that they worship is strong, you know, like the the bull or like the, the lion or the bear, or, you know, whatever, you, yeah, whatever, the serpent, you know, it, it's, it's stuff like that. But I don't believe that you're actually worshiping these things. And it's after a while, it's years after that the Lord of law making images. But before that, you know, there was no law against uh, these things. So now that the law is in place, therefore people, you know, not allowed to, um, to, to make an uh, image. But we, we talk about that making image today and uh, a lot of us still wearing Jesus on the cross <laughs> and you have it around your neck and the, all this kind of thing. If we don't want image, how do you think we're supposed to get rid of it? You don't think the, the cross with, you know, even though you don't have no, um, no body on it, you don't have a Jesus on it, it's an image still. You know, so if we say we go in according to um, the book, all of these things, we, we have to get rid of them. All right, we stay there for today. Most High God, we thank you, we praise you, and we worship you. Continue, Lord, to open up our eyes and our ears, even as we look into your words. Have that moment, we pray, Father, in the name of your Son.